racing uh, was in my blood. We did it again. And Roger Penske, one of the smartest guys in the world. He's on point. He's always a lead guy. He's taking everybody with him. Checkered flag for Rick Mears. He's won the Indianapolis 500 with a hand in the air. If you think we're busy, follow this man around for a week. I said, you'll feel like a complete bum. Roger, fantastic. You're driving against him. You're not in as good position as you are when you're driving for him. <laughs> Alan Sir Jr. about to reassert himself as the king of the beach as he takes the Penske car across the line. Roger Penske is a living legend, a multidisciplinary maestro who went from racing single-seaters and sports cars in the 1960s to establishing a transportation empire employing some 56,000 people around the world and running some of the most influential teams in motorsport. He remains today a colossus in both the worlds of racing and business. My interest in motor racing started when I was early on. I loved cars. My dad took me to Indy when I was 14. That might have been the turning point for me, Indy car racing and uh, just going fast. Roger Penske's career began as a driver whilst he was in college racing hill climbs and ovals. He began competing in Sports Car Club of America races in 1958, winning the National D Modified Championship in 1961 and establishing himself as a professional driver. But it was with his own custom car design that he would really make an impact on the world of racing and lay the foundations for his future racing empire. When I think about the 60s, I really think about the Xerox Special. And that was a car that we built from a uh, wrecked Formula One Cooper and the 2.7 liter engine that Jack Brabham used at Indianapolis. And we took that combination together, put a body on it. We beat the best guys in the world out of Riverside. Those were days when you were racing against some great drivers, Gurney and Moss and uh, Parnelli Jones and Bruce McLaren and Jack Brabham. Those were great days. With his wins in the Riverside Grand Prix, Roger Penske's talent was firmly established, earning him the chance to race in NASCAR in 1963. My stint in NASCAR really was an invitation by Ray Nichols, a team owner from Chicago, and I was able to drive one of his Nichols Pontiacs at Raceway Park. It was a great chance for me to drive. In his second race in the car at the Riverside 250, Roger Penske came in first place, his only career stock car victory. When you think about my NASCAR career, it was, it was short, but uh, it was great. Faced with having to choose between a career as a racing driver or making his mark in the automotive industry another way, in 1965, Roger Penske decided to quit competing and shifted focus to his business and running cars and race teams instead. Had a career for a number of years, it was successful, but obviously uh, at a certain point, uh, when I was gonna become a Chevrolet dealer, I could not, uh, borrow money at a bank, I couldn't get insurance. And by the way, General Motors said, if you're gonna be a dealer, you can't go racing. His first major successes managing a race team came with Mark Donahue, an emerging talent who had distinguished himself racing for Ford and who joined the Penske team in 1966. Well, Mark Donahue was a sports car racer. I first met him up at Lime Rock Park and a uh, Brown graduate engineer. And uh, he and I became good friends and we talked about putting a team together that we connected. Uh, we talked about Indy, we talked about Can-Am and uh, he became almost like a brother to me. Almost at once, the Penske-Donahue pairing became a towering force in US racing. And the duo soon set their sights on winning the Indianapolis 500, one of the most prestigious races in motorsport. It's a hallmark race. It's the biggest race in the world when you think about a number of spectators. The reach of Indianapolis or Indy is just amazing. And, you know, we were kind of the outsiders coming in. It would take us three years to win the race, and that took place in uh, 1972. And then the finish. Grant over the line first, but in reality, almost a minute behind the winning Donahue. When you go to Indy and win and go across the bricks and see your car there and go into victory lane, and it's hard to believe that uh, you're standing there you know, with that kind of success. Our opportunity to win uh, Indianapolis with Mark Donahue in 1972 probably was one of the greatest victories. I think until you've been there, you don't realize the significance of it. And until you've understood the history, you don't realize really how prestigious it is to win that race. 
through the late 1970s and early 1980s with Mario Andretti and Tom Sneva driving, Penske became the team to beat in IndyCar. Competing for Roger Penske is a driver's dream. You know that he's going to have the equipment that you need to be able to get results. I'm so thankful that actually I can say that at least for a short stint in my career while I was moonlighting <laughs> with Roger because I was uh, committed to Formula One. However, with Andretti frequently abroad with his Formula One commitments, Penske wanted an American driver who could fill in for him. A chance encounter with a young Rick Mears would go on to become one of the most successful partnerships in IndyCar racing. It is a good story. I mean, it surprised me as much as anybody. When I first, I never dreamed of going to IndyCars, period. And uh, that was way out of my league. We were just racing for family recreation and a hobby. I really got to know him on Wally Dallenbach's uh, motorcycle ride through Colorado back uh, many years ago. Well, one morning, Roger and I were parked pretty close to each other, and I was knocking on doors at the time. I'd been talking to a couple, you know, other teams about getting a ride. I didn't have a ride at the time. And he says, I, I hear you're thinking about driving for so-and-so next year. I said, I've got something in mind. Give me a call before you make a deal with anybody else. He met me over at the Michigan Speedway. He was there at 6 in the morning knocking on the door. And uh, he then jumped in the car and drove it. And we could see the skills he had from being an off-roader. And at that point, uh, we connected. So he said, I'll guarantee at least six races. So I played hard to get for about five seconds. And uh, I knew a part-time offer with him would be better than a full-time with most anybody else. And, uh, and then as it turned out, we ended up running 10 races instead of six. And, and uh, ended up winning some races that year. And next year, I was in full-time. history of his wins, his poles, is just amazing. Really one of the greatest drivers in Indy history, and certainly put him right at the very top of our racing drivers that we've had at, at Team Penske. Mears time, three hours, eight minutes, and 47 seconds. He is the youngest winner since Mario Andretti won in 1969. The combination of Team Penske and Rick Mears became an almost unbeatable pairing. Happy Penske crew celebrates as Mears makes his way to victory lane. Between 1979 and 1991, Mears won three championships and four out of Team Penske's seven Indianapolis 500 wins. Roger was great. He just took that weight off my shoulders of expectation and allowed me to just go out there and, and do my job. And he's been that way all throughout. The championship became more competitive through the 90s, but Penske added more wins with former F1 driver Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unser Jr. Penske also entered NASCAR in this period, with rookie Rusty Wallace racing the number 16 Chevrolet in Atlanta. Wallace ended up finishing second in the race after qualifying seventh, and so began a new era of racing for Penske, one that would ultimately see him running teams at the top of both NASCAR and IndyCar. To manage this bold evolution, Penske would rely more and more on his ability to spot talent and develop it within his team. Our success in all racing is all about the people. We have very little turnover in our drivers, our, our key people. Tim Sendrick's been with us a number of years. Mark obviously was key to those early days. And to me, it's about that continuity. It's, it's that, that common thread that goes through your organization of wanting to win the transparency the integrity of the organization. When Roger asked me to, to come work for the team, I probably spent three or four months driving him crazy, trying to understand what my role was gonna be. Roger simply said, when you're here, you'll understand. And at that point in time, I knew that the team hadn't won a race since 1997. And they'd been sitting on their 99th IndyCar victory for you know two and a half years, trying to get win number 100. When Joe won the 100th race, that was really what kind of crack things wide open from there. With Sindrick at the helm, Penske enjoyed an extensive run of form during the 2000s, with Brazilian driver Elio Castroneves a key part of this success. Jill DeFerrin was one of our drivers recommended that we hire Elio. I'd seen him race for Carl Hogan. He'd been fast, and uh, his success right from the beginning from as a driver was amazing. The first year we went back to Indy in 2001, we ended up running first and second there. And really that was the first time the team had been back since they missed the race in 1995. So I know it was a huge relief to Roger and, and the team to, 
to reestablish itself at Indy. That judgment doesn't matter. Catherine Nevis goes for the fence again. Team Penske went on to win the Indianapolis 500 five times in the 2000s, with Elio Castroneves at the wheel for three of those victories. Up with Elio Castroneves, and my honor to deliver you the milk of Indianapolis. I'm going to do exactly like I did last year. During this period, Penske also ran Porsche's sports car program, co-developing the RS Spyder LMP2 car, which would challenge the dominance of Audi's R8. In 2008, Penske Racing and Porsche upended the status quo in sports cars by winning the 12 hours of Sebring with the Spyder, giving Porsche its first overall win at the event in 20 years and breaking Audi's eight-year stranglehold on the race. When you think about the Spyder that we were able to develop along with the Porsche Motorsports team was amazing because Audi had been winning most of the races. Uh, you know, we put a team together, two cars, won the championship. And of course, the big one for me was that car won Sebring 12-hour race against the Audis. Anytime you win at Sebring, for us, it was the first time for me and first time for our team. And uh, when we could deliver wins for a partner that we have like Porsche, it just cements that relationship. It's a special car and one that we treasure every single day at our team. In the mid-2000s, Team Penske, under the guidance of Tim Sindrick, started to refocus its efforts on the underperforming NASCAR division. I really didn't know the ins and outs of, of running a NASCAR team, so uh, it, was, it was a very difficult time, but I also knew that we had never won a championship as, as Team Penske. We had never won a Daytona 500. There were a lot of shortcomings, and at that point, Penske was in the in the mid-tier, really, and, and I couldn't really understand. And it was an eye-opener for me that it didn't have the, that name or that, uh, that group didn't have the respect that I guess I was accustomed to in the other forms of motorsport. It took until 2008 for the team to finally achieve its potential, winning the Daytona 500, the pinnacle event of the sport. 2008, winning the first Daytona 500 and actually running first and second there. That was a, a huge proud moment for Roger. Ryan Newman, Roger Penske wow. win the Daytona 500. Way to go, guys, way to go. I remember walking out of inspection with him, you know, back to the car, and he didn't want to leave the place that night because he had finally won, and, you know, it happened to be the 50th running of the race, so it's the only gold trophy that, that ever exists. Joey Logano wins the Daytona 500. With NASCAR flourishing once more, Team Penske went on to achieve one of the most remarkable feats in motor racing, winning both the Indy 500 and Daytona 500 in the same year. When you think about winning the Indy 500 and the Daytona 500 the same year, you couldn't write that down. And uh, winning the Daytona 500 with Joey Logano and then having the opportunity to see Montoya, who really ended up starting in the back of the field, come through and win that race today and Will Power was second. It was a special day and uh, I'd like to have it happen again many times. After a lifetime in racing in the automotive industry, Roger Penske is as driven to succeed as ever. Known to many simply as the captain, it is the immense network of people who he works and races with and whose lives he had touched that will remain his legacy. He's like any of these guys that you see at the very top of their game in anything, in sport, you know, whether it's Tom Brady or Michael Jordan, you know, Roger in business, they're all very, very detail orientated. They don't let anything slide, and I think that's the key to success. Roger is so unique and so different on so many levels. You know, the, the guy that really, in, in my mind, is really the definition of, of motorsports, and whether it's in the, in the business world or the racing world, he's so far out in front of everybody else. He, he's the yardstick, and, uh, and I, I think anybody else in the paddock would say the same thing. Has always struck me the most about Roger is just when he's in, he's in all the way. Yeah, Roger is such a driven individual, but he's so down to earth at the same time. He respects his employees, doesn't matter if they're at the very bottom of the, of the tree or right at the top. What it takes is desire, passion, love for what you're doing. And um, by participating, you know, in all the majors, he has won everything that he's entered. And uh, why? Because he just loves the sport.